Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebase.com. We're continuing with our series of questions for the basis of the 2023 ISB convention here in beautiful Ann Arbor, Michigan. Today's question is, tell us about a base that you'd love to own. Well, I mean, I feel like I already have my dream instrument, honestly. Yes. Mitch, uh, Mitch Mooring made this beautiful 5.8s for me. But I, I have tried quite a few fantastic instruments this week. And I do want to call out and celebrate some shops that are doing some really innovative things. At this ISB, it's the first time I've ever seen 5 8 instruments at this volume. Yes. There have been so many smaller bases, and it's just creating such an impact on the accessibility of the instrument. So everywhere from the Burton Instruments booth to Tom Wolf's booth, um, there's a 5 8 instrument at um, at Robbie, Robbie McIntosh. McIntosh. Thank you. Robbie McIntosh's booth has a, a 5 8 a brand new build. Helen McIntosh's first instrument that she chose to make a 5 8 instrument and it's a very exciting instrument. Um, there's a small Juzek at the Colstein booth and um, and the Robertson shop is doing some wonderful shop 5 8 bases these days too so I've seen some some awesome stuff. Oh and and the Eastman booth has two 5 8 bases there one of which is Ralph Alcala's prototype of his, his new make. Wow, there's a lot to do. It's just so exciting seeing these developments. It's a really golden age for yeah. uh, the double bass. Charlie Hayden's view and bass. Great answer. No one said that yet. But yeah. I, yeah. Does Charlie mean a lot to you, his music? He yeah. does. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was someone I, I didn't check out a lot growing up. My father was an influence, obviously, yeah. and the first basis he turned me on to was Scott LaFaro. But I've slowly made my way, you know, into guys like Charlie Hayden and Gary Peacock. Yeah. But it, it was funny, you know, when, when my exploration of Charlie Hayden really started, you know, I, I used to play sessions and gigs in Manhattan and people would tell me that I sounded like him. And I was like, that's funny, I've never listened to him. So I, I kind of feel in a way I, I'm guided by his spirit at times, to be honest with you, because there was information and sounds just coming through me that I felt like, you know, I'm in touch. I'm in touch with this guy, so I might, I might as well, you know, really dive into that and see what he's about. And honestly, if if anyone that's watching this hasn't checked him out, also highly encourage it. Well, it was fun to play uh, Nick Lloyd's copy of Edgar's Bass. Oh, so you got the opportunity I, to spend time with that. It was fun to play. I, I kind of felt like I was role playing because <laughs> once you play that instrument, you're like, I need to sound like Edgar. So yeah, you know, so it was fun. I wouldn't take it home. Just because I I don't want that I like I want to find my own sound. But, yeah. Um, that was really fun to kind of like I felt like I was at you're really at a convention you know a Star Trek convention or something and like everyone's in costume and I'm like I'm gonna cosplay as Edgar Meyer for <laughs> five minutes you know um, so that was fun. Yeah. But um, I really enjoyed the bass that Nina purchased uh, Hans Sturm's old uh, Ken Wall. Yes. And uh, oh, did that belong to Hans? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know the connection. So, but yeah. I've been, it's being uh, it's been demoed by our booth just next mm. door to us. So we've heard quite a lot of it this week, and it's a yeah. really wonderful sounding instrument. Yeah. And I think it's a perfect match for Nina and her I know. artistry. I know. It's it's really and it's just fun to play. I'm going to borrow it. I think sometime if she lets me. Well, right now I have to say it's the one that I actually own and I, and I played yesterday, which is a beautiful instrument that Arnold Schnitzer made for me. It's about six years ago and it was fantastic that uh, yesterday at my quartet's performance he was in the room and I could uh, give him a shout out. Uh, but because of that, because of that... Uh, you have that bass. I have that bass, yes. And because of my performance and the preparation for it, I actually did not have a chance to walk around and, and play instruments. So it's the only instrument I've played at the convention so far. Well, I think that Arnold is one of the absolute top uh, luthiers. And I, his in, I, I think the favorite bass that I've mod by a modern maker that I played was his ergonomic model that I played at the convention. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, one of the previous ones, and it was uh, absolutely unbelievable. Well, it was at the ISB. I mean, I've been coming to these since 1999, yeah. and I would pick any of his instruments up, and they would be so playable. It was just uh, always remarkably different from a lot of other instruments. So that that's eventually, it, it was fantastic that he agreed to, to build one for me. And 
Chris and I love to talk about double basses because I think we probably have quite similar tastes. I love the instrument that you play. Um, in fact, tell us about that bass. What's the bass that you spend most of your time on? It is the very first new standard La Scala hybrid. Uh, the one when Arnold was still running the company. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the very first one they made. In fact, it's the one that's still all the pictures up on the website. So, really? Is, yeah. that, is it that bass? Yeah. It's, I think it was made in 2002, maybe, or 2005, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I got it in 2005. And Arnold is an incredible maker, and we spoke to him earlier about years, and we yes. were talking about his ergonomic base. And, his and what I have work. told my students, and I, the thing I will say all the time is that if anything that that bass can't do, you blame the player for. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And so if you could pick another instrument, any instrument, like just take it home with you, no one's going to say anything, what would it be? It's funny that you say that, because uh, uh, in 2019 at ISB, no, in 2017 I saw the first of those. So normally I'm totally happy with my bass. Yeah. Uh, in 2017 I played Arnold's Ergo bass. Actually, I met yeah, you yeah, there yeah, playing we, that we, bass. Yeah. We have a picture of us. I've got some pictures of us. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, he let me. He was nice enough to let me practice on that bass in the hallway. He said it'll draw attention to the bass, and you don't have a bass, so you can practice. So I fell in love with that bass. Uh, it's well beyond my price range. In 2019, uh, Seth Kimball's Bigfoot's guitar, I played that and it was the same thing. Yes. Uh, same price range too. Yeah. And just this year, I was uh, yesterday I was just at Nick Lloyd's uh, booth and his number 60 seven eights was just fantastic i mean it it just almost plays itself we're so lucky to have these incredible uh modern makers ah oh, golly uh actually it's kind of funny there's uh i think bass violin shop has one that's like two hundred thousand dollars yeah i'll say that <laughs> and uh actually we were talking about that this morning i ran into them earlier it's like you know i could sell my house and still have and buy this base and still have enough over for a down payment yeah for another house uh but you know, I'd also like to go home and stay married, so that's <laughs> not going to happen. Um, I think, though, I, I'm really in love with Mitch Mooring's basses. Yeah. He's making some just really fine instruments. Yeah. Uh, there's a Hannah Main over at Bass Violin oh, Shop. Cool. That's just, it's exactly what I like in a bass. It's really? not. It's got a huge tone, but it's not too oversized to play mm -hmm. on. I can get around on it really nicely. That's a perfect so, combination, yeah, isn't exactly. it? Yeah, exactly. So it's a nice axe. You know, I mean, my favorite bass that I've yeah. had over 60 years is uh, uh, I call her Athena. Um, we don't know the maker because the back was replaced by Sicconi. He, he made the, the back on it. But, uh, um, and it's a beautiful instrument. It's my love. And I've never found a bass that I, I fell in, more in love with than that one. And then, of course, I had Kusevitsky's bass. You know, that's not bad either. <laughs> um, there was a bass that I did fall in love with. It, it belonged to a member of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. It was a pear-shaped bass. It had truly the most beautiful sound of any instrument I've ever heard. Um, and I really wanted that instrument. Uh, it was perfect. And so I bought it. And then I thought, you know, because I, I, tra I travel a lot. And this was an old bass, and I looked at it after getting it, and I said, gee, I'm not so sure that this is a very healthy bass. Popped the top off, took it to an x-ray machine at our local hospital, and it came out, the x-ray came out looking like a spaghetti factory. So I sent it back, I, you know, I said, you know, there's no way I could, but, and it was such a disappointment because it's such a beautiful bass. Another pear-shaped bass, so two, two pear-shaped basses that I really liked. Uh, the other one belonged to Anton Torello, first, uh, first principal bass player of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And then this was a family of bass players. Were, he had two sons, both who played bass. And so they, that instrument was in their family for 100 years, and I bought it. And, uh, and I traveled with that. I, I traveled around the world with it. And that had an absolutely glorious sound but it had a wolf on the top open string. And so that was... It's not going to work for us. So that didn't quite work. It's not going to work for the world's most renowned solo. I know, so, <laughs> I, I mean, any instrument you buy, I think it has to be a compromise. Yeah, you know, I think that is wonderful advice. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's tough. I mean, a, a lot, I, I was a tone judge in Indiana, so I spent time with uh, 25 bases there, yes. and 
I tell you what, I, it's a little bit like, um, you know, the people who find the cats in the neighborhood and then they have like 25 cats at their house yes. because I think I would be like that person. <laughs> I would be like the, because each space that I was touching, I, I feel like I want to help create the sound of this instrument. I want to, I want, I want to explore this and help it develop, um, this, this, its own voice. So, uh, Again, I know I know where you're coming from with the question. I guess what I would say uh, this week is that there's a luthier who's done a lot of work on three of on the three bases that I interact with, uh, Zachary Martin, and he's done restoring work on those instruments, and he's brought his own bass here. So that for me is very fun to see his own creation. So I think if there was one bass that I was going to take home, and I didn't play them all, it might be uh, Zachary Martin's new new bass. I think it's also important to highlight that many of the people who haven't attended a uh, the convention might not realize that there is an incredible project, which is the Build a Base project here. And literally, I saw a base being made within days, but practically uh, put together, assembled, performed on stage by yourself playing an absolutely stunning oh, uh, recital. It was just gorgeous. But it was Body and Soul, I think you were playing, is that yeah, right? Yeah, well, I had planned to play a piece with piano, but. Uh, there was no piano on site because Victor uh, and Steve had had the stage set differently. Yeah. So I arrived uh, to play the new instrument and then I had to come up with something to play. So I played body and soul because I think they build the body of the bass, right? The makers. And we players try to build the, find the soul. Yeah. And then I did a little bit of I got it bad and that ain't good to, so that people could hear the pitch sound too. Wow. Um, and one thing about this build a bass that's amazing is, you know, it's, it came from this culture of ISB. Because in the earliest days, if you talk to Gary Carr, he said that they would gather just to say, how are you, how are you doing what you're doing? And, and oh, I do it like this. And, oh, really, have you tried this? And oh, I did that, but I use a different string. Oh, what kind of end pen? And next thing you know, they're exchanging all these ideas in a totally free form way. Well, maybe musicians have done that for a long time, but luthiers tend, the, as I understand it, the culture is very much in, in the back shop, you yes. know, you have trade secrets and it's you more have- more solitary pursuit in some ways. I think that's true. And I also think there's a culture of sort of handing it down, but behind closed doors. The ISB luthiers blew all that out of the water. They just yeah. said, hey, this is what I do. Here are my measurements. And some of them still talk to you. They say, I can't believe it. She just handed me her, her measurements for the, the thing or, or uh, and so, that, that's what this build a base is. It, the fact that there's a base is wonderful, but that's an absolute byproduct of the experience for them. If you talk to them, it's all about getting your hands on the wood and going through the process together in, in, in community. And, you know, it must be an amazing thing to, it would be like bowing and then having someone else bow while I'm holding, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the collaborative I effort. I see. This is how Simone Marciniak uses the bow. Oh, this is Nina Brad is doing this on the up bow. And you see what I mean? Absolutely. And they, and they love it. And, and the, the instrument is fantastic. It was really fun to yeah. play it. But uh, I think, it, again, it's the community. And the fact that there's instruments at the end is kind of. Yeah. So that's, they, they raffle them and raise money for our nonprofit. And that's. Well, I think to win a base in a sweepstake, I don't think I've seen a happier person than the, uh, uh, the, the, the young person who won the instrument yesterday. Yeah. Right? So it was a very special moment. So thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, yeah. That, I, was, I was very happy for, for him. And, uh, you know, my, my own tickets didn't win, but that's okay. <laughs> Somebody else's did. There's always the next time. Yeah, there's always the next time. Well, the uh, Max Bibo of the Australian Chamber Orchestra has a Gasparo de Salo from, I think, the mid mid 1500s, and I played 30 seconds on it. Oh, you didn't you do? But I would like to not on that one. I, I but I would absolutely like to get to know that bass better cool. and maybe take it home with me. Well, I don't think it's going to happen, but I like the basses that I have. Yeah, I've really? been very fortunate to have purchased an old Juzek when I was a teenager, yeah. and most of you know that Juzek made some himself. He had a studio that his name was on it. Some are not so great, and some are spectacular. And I got a spectacular bass. So cool. And I really like it. And I've thought ever since a teenager, and coming to all these events for all these years, that someday I would replace it. I have not replaced it. I have added other instruments. 
I have an Upton, a Bohemian model, and I love it. And I've had it for several years now, and it has developed. That's the one I keep at school, and I play most of the recitals there, and I use it off campus for some things. I still use my David Gage Chuck E's bass. I really love that also. Uh, same story there, it, I got a really good one. The, I recorded with it. I like it that much. And of course for outdoor gigs, that's my go-to. But I also have an eminence that I use on occasion and I like that very much too. What about in terms of strings? Because I'm thinking that you are known for somebody that plays a lot of jazz with the bow. Really, come, it's really integrated into your music. Is I mean, where have you landed in in the in the string world? Because I mean, that's a question that a lot of jazz bass players, I'm sure, would have for you. Currently, I'm using the Dario Zyx Light. Nice set. I used Corelli's intermediates for years and years and years and years yeah. until these Zyx came out. They're a bit more affordable. Yeah. I like it. There are things about the Corellis that I miss with the D'Addario's, but I like them. I currently, on one of my bases, I'm trying out the Heritage strings from Colstein to great effect. So, yeah. So I missed one bass, I forgot. Oh, which was that? My mighty old K bass. Oh, we've all got to have a lovely K bass, is it? Yeah. yeah. And it is strong with artificial guts, yeah. innovation silver slaps. So it has that Paul Chambers sound. Yeah, I, I always wanted to own a Prescott. Like every time I've ever played a Prescott, I'm like, Classic oh my God. Device. Yeah. But it just never worked out. And, you know, I remember once uh, I was doing a concert in Detroit, which is near here. And I borrowed one from the symphony. And uh, they were like, okay, we'll lend you our Prescott. I'm like, wow, sure. <laughs> And it was like maybe the best bass I've ever played in my life. You know? Was it quite big? Because I always get the feeling, or I get the impression they are big. That they like are big. The string length, string length is yeah. Some of the this one did not have a particularly long string length, so it was it was playable. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. cool. Mine. Yes, that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, Tell it was it. it was one of those things. I I was a graduate student in San Diego, UC San Diego, and I didn't have a bass of my own, and so the. I house sat for my bass teacher, Bert Turetsky, and he said, I have three basses, try them all out, find out what you love in an instrument, you know, and he gave me a whole list of things to check against, and it was before I'd ever been to an ISB, so I never had a chance to, like, experience basses like here, but I had a summer taking care of these three basses for him, and then when I had my second year of graduate school, I got, a, well, the financial aid support was as an out-of-state person, yeah. but I had in-state residency by that point, so I had this little extra wad of cash yeah. that I put literally in my my 501 jeans pocket, and I went up to Metzler's Violin Shop, and I had tried 20 different bases. I never looked at the price tags, I never looked at anything, and I tried all the things that Bert had asked me with register and low ease and all that. I couldn't find anything I liked, and Lisa Gass was actually working there at the time, who's wow. a wonderful base. Yeah. yeah, she's fabulous. Yeah. And so I said, well, is there anything else? And she said, you know, somebody brought a base in the other day. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but you're welcome to give it a try. And I played the low E, and it was just like. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. And then I went up into the higher register and thumb position. I was like, oh. All I have is $5,000, yeah. I hope that, and it was like, I didn't know how to bargain, I didn't know how yeah. to do anything, but it was like, we've been together since 1992, oh, so and it's... So what kind of bass is it? It's, it's a Morelli. A Morelli, oh wow, lovely. Yeah, I totally looked at it, I have no idea who owned it before, it, yeah. it had had at one point some kind of massive injury, yeah. so the shoulder has been repair, the great repair, the neck is bolted on forever, yeah. um, I can't travel with it anymore because I've got a travel base, I have a gauge bolt base for that, oh, cool. that I had tricked out by Jason Brown oh, in yeah. LA, yeah. and so it's, he moved the sound post and the bridge, Just and, right. and he drilled a hole in the bottom for my end pin, and so it's really carbonated. Oh, combinate it. That's yes. Cool. Are you gonna have to? Have you done an album with that name? Because if not, we need to. You know? No, but my <laughs> our, our our company is Corbination. Oh, why really? So yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. You know, um, the last convention I played at was in 2019. Yeah. 
And um, I played a bass made by, I think, Tetsu Suzuki. Tetsu Suzuki. Yes, he's an incredible it, it it was. Today, yes, well. he's here. I, I got to go say hi to him, but it was a $30,000 bass. He, it took him three weeks to make it. Whoa. John Patitucci played the same bass in a recital. And anyway, that bass, I played it with Bill Mays and Tim Frontzik in a trio. It's on YouTube, actually. Yeah, I was that. Yeah. And man, that thing just played itself and it was singing to me and yeah. I felt like we had a nice harmony together. You, you guys know? had a nice connection. Yeah, too. yeah. And then I also had a $3,000 bow that I had tried a bunch of bows. And yeah. see, this, this is like a kid in a candy store place, you know, I could pick out a bow. Yeah. And, a, and a really pricey bass that I, that's like driving a Mercedes top end and uh, you know play that for a night you know because normally I mean I don't my basses aren't as expensive as those yeah. I'm used to them so I can play them well yeah but it isn't like I just pick it up and it's like oh my god you know yeah yeah, yeah. very special maker right I have the most amazing instrument of my own I, I have I, I play a Martin Penning instrument and he made it for me at back in uh, 2013. And uh, I'm just super happy with it. I just played the Nick Lloyd one, the one he did, the copy of, uh, of uh, oh, Edgar Meyer's one. Yes. And it's fantastic. I it's bet a, it is. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. a really cool answer. Big shout out to Martin Penning, who's a wonderful, oh, yeah. uh, a wonderful luthier. Well, it's my bass. <laughs> so, oh, great answer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my bass made by Jim Ham. Uh, it's now 20 years old. I love it. It's uh, I've never played a bass that uh, I've wanted that I would ever swap it for. Yeah. Um, now there's other instruments like you know I play lots of different styles of music, so a lot of times I'm some, constantly looking for that instrument that's going to play like Jim's bass that he built for me, but maybe uh, have a different timbre or you know or even just sometimes a second one that I can keep in a different tuning for different music. Um, so I you know I'm, I'm still looking for other instruments, but as far as my primary instrument, I'll never replace that instrument. And how do you have that tuned? Because it's got the is, am I thinking this the extension and then are, are, yeah is it low? Yeah, what is it? it's standard solo tuning. Oh, okay. Um, so I usually most of the instru most of the groups I play with. And um, I use that solo tuning. Yeah. Uh, so it's just standard. Um, sometimes I tune low string to orchestra tuning, so I have a low C instead of a low D with my extension. Yeah. But most of the time it's solo tuning, and I have the extension open to the whole step down. So I have sounding pitch E A E. Uh, so sorry, uh, E B E A is my sounding pitch open strings. Wow. Um, but I, you know, I, of course, I think of them as D A. D, G, you know, yes. but, um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and what about the brand of strings? Because you're somebody who I've seen so many people, especially on TalkBase, talk when you release some of these videos where you're really virtuosic playing. And I remember there's been a lot of conversation about are you right. using Corelli? Are, you know, what's what's on your base at the moment anyway? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's a, such a funny question, you know, because I can, uh, I mean, it's, I, it's great. I mean, we, we, we all are kind of gearheads, I think, as bass players, and we're yeah. all looking for that thing. And, um, you know, uh, but that's something surely I'm going to get 50 comments whenever I put something yeah. up what strings I'm using. Um, so most of the time on my hand bass, I have uh, Prestro Permanence on the top two and Spiracore or, or Spiracore solo tune on the bottom two. And that's, um, I think Edgar Meyer at least used to use that same string combination. And, and um, I've been using that combination for about 15 years, I think, um, on, I've, I've used different sets of strings. Um, sometimes I'll have, um, I know that some of my videos I've had, um, they were Kaplan solo strings, but they were actually like a prototype Kaplan. Um, I don't think they were the, the released version. Um, and then I go back and forth when I'm playing more jazz oriented music. Um, currently I have um, uh, Spirocore Vikes, but um, you know, I, I'm always, like those I change every few months. Like those I've never found the right string for me, that I'm happy with the pit sound and, I, and I'm happy with the bowed sound. That's still like the eternal quest for me. Yeah. Um, as far as like when I'm, you know, 90% bowing, which is mostly what I do on my ham, the permanence and Spirocore solo uh, sets work really well for me. Is love? an instrument that I particularly love. Well, I have a Paul Hart, and I absolutely love his basses. Wow. Um, I have the one that he made in 2017, um, but I tried one uh, that one of my other friends played as well, and he just made a new bass. It's a little bit bigger, but I think I would take that one home so if I had to that? choose. Um, I would have to I would have to ask Aaron yeah. for a oh, little a few more details, but it just had a beautiful sound, um, beautiful ring, and um, it was just very. It just felt like home. Like it was just a very very like similar instrument to the one that I play and that I hold dear to my heart. Oh, that's, a, that's awesome. Well, when I was 
it's in school at Indiana University, and this would have to be 50 some odd years ago. Yes. Uh, uh, I went to the home of the Philadelphia bass section player, Fred Batchelder. Wow. Who had a, one of the world's largest collections of Italian bass basses. And he wasn't selling any of them, but uh, for some reason I got to go there and play on the basses and, and he had a test story. Um, and I played on that bass and I just, I couldn't believe it. And so I've always been looking for a test story. Um, uh, Colstein made a test story copy. Wasn't exactly the experience. I actually bought a Baldatoni bass, a beautiful Italian guitar shaped bass that I loved and had some of that quality. I played I owned a, a Storioti and a, and a Joseph Galliano, two great Italian instruments. The problem with those instruments is the sound and the articulation and the feeling and the soul and the, the, the butterscotch feeling is wonderful, but they're harder to play because of the shape of the instrument, because they're harder to get around. And uh, uh, so that is a challenge because they, what, what we're doing today, when we're, and I'm playing most solo, I'm not playing in the orchestra anymore, so um, that upper bout needs to be like that Kenwall shape for me, and, uh, but to have that shape wasn't the defined shape for the old Italian masters, it had the rounder shoulders, so that's, that's kind of a challenge, uh, but Test Story has the magic name for me. Yeah, there was this bass that I just played. Do you remember what, where we played that? I don't know. I don't remember who the maker was, but it was this tiny little small bass. It felt really good. It had this like handle on the side. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was light, but it was a beautiful low end, really clear high end. Yeah, it was solid. But I also have to give a shout out to Optin Bass. That, that's the bass that I have. And I have had that bass for almost 10 years now. It's, it's my love. I have the Russian model. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So you find that these smaller instruments are kind of appealing to you more? Because I see more and more makers, Mitch Mooring, or many people making yeah. five eighths instruments. And it feels like, uh, yeah, it's great that we've got all of these options. So. Yeah, I think that the smaller instruments are definitely more in style, and especially with Gary Card, who is also one of my teachers. But um, I have I have a big I have a big bass. I, I don't know why I like it. I like a big bass, but I also do gravitate towards a smaller one. So yeah. hopefully one day I can have a, the my Russian and then a smaller bass as well. well that, those Upton basses are very special. I'm a big fan of what they're doing over there in Mystic. I hope you enjoyed that. It's been fascinating seeing what people chose. What would you choose? Tell us about a base that you would love to own and I'll also share my preference in the comments. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.